So, um, I, okay, so uh, Oedipus uh, Tyrannus, or Oedipus the King, or Oedipus uh, uh, Rex, um, is uh, remarkably is one of the uh, a few plays that that we have um, that focuses um, that wh whose events uh, take a uh, 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 place mostly in the past. It's about discovery of the past. Um, so really, um, you should know the background of the play. So we are when the when the play starts. Uh, Oedipus is the king of Thebes. Um, he was made king a few years earlier uh, when uh, he arrived um, at Thebes and um, uh, 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 helped the city get rid of um, uh, um, the monster uh, Sphinx uh, who had been ravaging uh, uh, the city. Um, for that, uh, because the city had been uh, had recently lost its king, King Laius. He was given the rulership and also um, the uh, widowed queen of the previous uh, um, king. Um, now, when the play starts, uh, he is receiving his subjects uh, uh, to listen to them about uh, uh, their current distress. Uh, regarding uh, a plague and a disease that is uh, uh, once again ravaging uh, the city, um, making, um, uh, 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 bringing death and making women sterile and making the land sterile. There is constantly this association between uh, human and land uh, fertility and also um, uh, killing the disease, killing people. So he's determined to. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, solve the, 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 find the reason why he's told that um, the reason that the that the, the city is suffering uh, from the plague and the disease uh, is because the city had never investigated the murder of the previous king, King Laius, um, and um, uh, and uh, as a result, the murderer was uh, uh, still uh, among uh, among the city, uh, polluting okay the city. And the result, the disease is, according to the first information we receive, a result of of that. Um, so uh, uh, Oedipus. Um, so this is this is the situation. This is uh, the, uh, where when the uh, the play starts. Just before that, um, as we will find out, uh, just before he arrived at uh, Thebes and um, uh, uh, got the, um, got rid of the Sphinx and got the rulership, uh, Oedipus, on his way to Thebes, uh, had killed an old man um, on a, a a spot that is called the Three Roads. And just before that, uh, uh, he had uh, consulted the Oracle of Delphi uh, about his origins, about his uh, ancestry. And he had received this horrific oracle that um, he was going to kill his father and marry his mother. Now, Oedipus uh, always thought of himself as uh, the son of the king of Th uh, of Corinth, a different city away um, uh, from uh, from Thebes, and that's why he decided not to ever come back to um, to Thebes, uh, to to Corinth, so that he th this horrific oracle doesn't come true. Now, even before that, so I'm showing you how kind of I mean this is a, a play that really goes you know backwards. Even before that. Um, Oedipus, um, having grown up in the city of Corinth um, and being a, a, a young man, during a drunken episode, he was told by one of his uh, fellow symposiasts that actually he's not the son of the people he, he thought uh, he was. Um, and even before that, um, I'm sure you, you know the, the story, um, Oedipus actually, I mean, this is something that uh, as you will find out, is true. Um, even before that, he was um, actually adopted by the king of Thebes, having been exposed as a baby uh, on Mount Kithiron, okay, because the king um, and his real father was actually the king of Thebes, 
Elias, um, who having received an oracle that his baby would kill him and uh, marry his mother and have children with his mother, um, decided to um, get rid of the baby and expose. So this is, I mean, we took the story of Oedipus going backwards. And now uh, in my talk, I'm going to take the story uh, going forwards. Um, and I realized that, um, uh, especially if you have, if you have studied the play, I realized that the title of my talk may sound a bit strange, okay, because it juxtaposes things that you would not normally see lumped together uh, in a traditional analysis of Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannus. What does uh, the house and the mountain have to do with abstract concepts, okay, such as fate and responsibility? I gather that most of you are here because um, you are studying the play at school. Those of you who have already read some uh, Greek drama, and this play in particular, will be familiar with the concepts of the tragic hero, fate and responsibility, because usually these are the tools with which this play, like much of Greek tragedy, is read. Now I am not going to say that this is not the correct way of reading the play, and please do not think I said that. I do not ever believe that there is only one authoritative reading or interpretation of any play. Okay. Uh, but what I would like to do today is, as a Greek theater scholar, and also as a scholar of Greek myth and culture, to help you see another dimension which can be considered alongside these traditional readings regarding faith and responsibility. Uh, and I hope that can be relatable in a different way to young people like you and also specialist, non-specialist audiences of the play. This dimension has to do with imagery and dramaturgy, the imagery and the dramaturgy of the play the very elements which make this play exciting theater in the first play. Okay, Oedipus Tyrannus is not a novel, <laughs> it is theater. It's, uh, it, it is meant to be produced on stage, performed, as well as also the way it is constructed as a world full of significant and symbolic spaces. Um, now, I'll start with Aristotle like everybody does. So the influence of Aristotle and his poetics on how we have been reading the play from antiquity to today has been enormous okay, and cannot be overestimated. In light of his points about the hamartia um, or fatal flaw or error, I, I'm sure many of you will have studied this um, concept. I mean, it is examined actually in OCR. Um, uh, so in light of, of Aristotle's comments about what makes a good tragic hero, uh, this is what he says, such a person, a relatably tragic hero, that is, is someone who falls into adversity, not through evil and depravity, but through some kind of error, hamartia. Okay? and one belonging to the class of those who enjoy great renown and prosperity, such as Oedipus. So, in the light of these comments, for a vast majority of readers, the play has become a moral story of power, hubris, guilt, and punishment. Oedipus is the excessively proud ruler who, although hugely intelligent and talented, is also insufferably sure of himself, arrogant, prone to anger and prone to, uh, and ready to jump to conclusions. This ultimately clashes with a higher order, the only order that can claim certainties, and the hero is punished for his hubris. Okay, this is a traditional reading. I think this reading, which, okay, I've, I've put it down a bit schematically here, hubris, which means essentially excess, okay, uh, plus, Hamartia, which means fatal error or flaw, equals punishment for the hero, and then catharsis for the audience, carries a lot of truths. But I have to tell you that I believe that it has caught on so widely, not so because it does full justice to this complex play and to Sophocles' poetry, 
but because it is so conveniently clear, especially for the purposes of teaching in a school context. But now here you are in a university context, so I'm going to give you, um, you know, my, the, the, the point of view from a university context. I, and also I hope that at least some of you, by reading the play, have felt that this kind of schematic representation, uh, a schematic reading of the play, is not exactly all. Witnessing and being shaken and horrified by the relentless magnetism that the hero, with which the hero is drawn towards the truth, um, and finally into this car crash that is his, the discovery and realization of who he is, I hope that you have felt that this rather square and technical description might sound a little bit reductive as well. Now, as a student, of Greek tragedy for more than 25 years, one thing that I'm sure about is that this art, um, and I know this may sound a little bit of a cliche, but it is true, uh, this art, the art of tragedy, is about big universal questions. Okay? Above all, tragedy explores what it means to be human. And well, at least uh, the preoccupation with the universal uh, issues, okay, uh, the big questions is one area that I agree with Aristotle about. One of the things that are profoundly important uh, for humans is the sense of identity that we need to have to feel security in the world around us. Who we are, where we come from, who our loved ones are, are fundamental components of our personal world which determine our identity, and we need to have a degree of security about them. This is exactly the area which is profoundly shaken in Oedipus's world from the start, from when he hears by chance in a drunken episode in Corinth that his origins are not what he always thought they are. This episode makes the hero set off on a journey, a journey which, sure, might be viewed in terms of hamartia and hubris and punishment, but it is above all a journey that captures the human need to know and feel secure about fundamental elements of one's identity. And as Greek myth and Greek tragedy often um, uh, do, uh, they often explore such big ideas by testing them in extreme forms. So Oedipus in this play becomes not just the paradigmatic, but also the extreme form of this fundamental uh, need of human need, um, fundamental search for certainty and security about one's identity. Throughout the whole play, Oedipus's need for certainties, and when these are shaken, his relentless magnetism towards the truth are unparalleled. And I said, I use this word journey, and I'll be using this word journey uh, a lot in this talk. And when I use it, I do not use it as a mere metaphor, okay, at least in the common way we understand, um, com in the way we commonly understand the word metaphor. Oedipus' whole life is mapped on the landscape uh, of central Greece through which he takes a journey. And as I will go on to explore, parts of which also are two elements of my title, the mountain the, and the land and the house of Thebes. Uh, by the way, this uh, map is from uh, this book, uh, 2017, um, Oliver Taplin's um, uh, translation and introduction and commentary to the play. Um, from um, I mean, whose reading also my, my I mean, with whose reading my reading also very much converges. Um, now, in the beginning of the play, uh, Oedipus's world is one that he thinks he's certain of. His origins are in Corinth. His father and mother are King Polybus and Merope. The drunken episode that shakes the foundations of his belief that he knows his origins in an early is an early manifestation of the central characteristic of Oedipus' entire being, that he's no friend to uncertainty. But we also spoke about this, uh, this more widely as a fundamental human being. This is what he tells Jocasta uh, later on uh, about his shaken belief and his desperate need to know uh, following this drunken episode. On the next day, 
I went and put the issue to my father and mother in Corinth. They were furious against the man who had let slip this insult that I am not uh, the son of the parents that I thought I was. I was glad of their assurances, and yet this kept on needling me and spreading. So without my father and mother knowing, I sailed secretly to Delphi. So he crosses the Gulf of Corinth and goes on to the Oracle of Delphi to find out what lies beneath that um, uncertainty that now he's feeling. Having received the prophecy that he will kill his father, sleep with his mother, and have children out of this incestuous coupling in Delphi, horrified, he turns away from the point of origin, from uh, his point of origin, in the hope that um, he's uh, safer, uh, more secure, and he continues his journey to this very important spot on the map, the three roads. Exactly, as you know, when he attempts to regain control, thinking that he's steering his life away from the prophecy catastrophe, okay, away from the house of thieves, away from the people that he thinks are his father and mother, mm, as you know, he goes head on for the fulfillment of the prophecy because he goes towards Thebes. On the way, he kills the man that later on, uh, on the way in this particular spot, the three roads, which we will explore in a minute, he finds out that he, he, um, uh, he um, uh, sorry, he, he, on the way he kills the man on the three roads, the man that he, uh, later on he finds out was his father, and also at the same time speeds up the second and most horrifying part of the fulfillment of the oracle to sleep with his mother. From the three roads, he goes head on to the city of Thebes, uh, and ultimately to his own paternal house, um, where he will discover who he really is, but also where everything will come crashing down. Now let us st stop and think a little bit about this. How important are these spaces that we have been marking out on the map? To start from the most curiously sounding one, the one that really, come on, really makes you wonder, is it circumstantial, or is it poetic detail, come on, should I think about it, should I ignore it, um, or is it something more suggestive, the three roads. Why three roads? Until recently, the three roads were given relatively little attention in scholarship. Uh, despite the fact that this space, okay, the three roads, the crossroads, is mentioned multiple times in the play and at crucial points of retracing the hero's journey. But if we take through the metaphor of a journey, okay, which I've been uh, suggesting that um, uh, this, uh, this play really uh, dramatizes uh, the, the metaphor life is a journey. Now, if we, uh, if we take through the metaphor of a journey, then the meeting point of these three roads really evokes a turning point in one's life. I'm at a crossroads, okay? Not least because of the necessity that it implies to choose which way to go. Having to leave behind Corinth, as we said, the Corinth of his fears that he will abuse his parents, and also the Delphi of the unbearable prophecies, there is only one way for him to go, and that's Thebes. There is another element about this meeting point uh, of the three roads. As a, a, another famous scholar, uh, Stephen Halliwell, has argued, crossroads are marked spaces for underworld spirits. In particular, uh, Halliwell makes the case that a crossroad is a place where the fury the demonic entity who causes madness to tragic characters is often associated with. In his recollection of the episode later on, uh, Oedipus's words about the land drinking the blood of the murdered man is, um, uh, are very uh, evocative of the way the fury is imagined elsewhere in tragedy, especially Aeschylus' Orestia, but also in Electra plays and so on. This is what he says about the three roads when he, as you can see from the lines of the play, this comes from the end of the play after his realization of the devastating truth. O oh, you three roads and secretive ravine and thicket with that narrow place where three roads meet, who drank my blood spilt by my hands, blood of my father's blood, do you remember still the acts that I committed there? Let me say at this point, okay, because now I'm kind of explaining to you, um, um, I mean, the uh, implied presence of the fury that brings madness at this in the, on, the, 
on the three uh, uh, on the crossroads. Let me say at this point as a brief parenthesis that for the Greeks, uh, their world, the universe, the nature all around them, was um, an entity um, not entirely separate from from the gods. Okay. On the contrary, a lot of things in, the, in their world that could not be easily understood from the behavior of nature okay, to even the behavior of their own emotions inside um, from anger, passion, love, madness, okay, so from outside events to inside um, uh, feelings, the Greeks, if they couldn't understand them, they named them gods. Uh, some of them from the underworld, like the Fury, some of them Olympian. Uh, the divine was, among many other things, a rather reassuring explanation for the many uncertainties that the world presented humans with. This, of course, does not go against the fact for those of you who do uh, Greek religion and wonder, oh, you know, so what does it mean? That's, that, uh, then if, he, if she represents feelings, then she's not a god. It does not go against the fact that the Greeks also regarded their gods as cult entities as well, worshipped and sacrificed to them. Okay, end of parenthesis. Now, moving on. So Oedipus ended this journey in search of his identity, of who he is, as we said, in the house of liars. Even more so than the three roads, this is a highly significant and highly charged space um, in the life story of Oedipus. And I say even more so than the three roads because even if the play initially seems, and, and, and uh, please pay attention to this, even if the play initially seems to emphasize that the killing of liars uh, is the central event of Oedipus's past and the main reason for you know, the cause of, of, of the plague, the pure horror that clearly emerges at the end, again, the connections we will be making um, uh, um, and, um, uh, in relation to the Helos Rife journey and, and his identity actually concerns the relationship with his mother. That's, I think, the pinnacle of horror. Um, um, okay. And the location that captures all of this, uh, and that's why I'm saying even more than the three roads where the murder of the father happened, is the house. Okay. It is in the house that the second part of the oracle came true. Oedipus married and slept unknowingly uh, with his mother and had children with her. In one of the most devastating descriptions of the messenger's speech at the end of the play, entering the spaces of the house, especially the bedroom, for Oedipus has connotations of entering the body of a woman in a sexual act. This is what he says, I, I will explain. Um, he howled a dreadful howl and then, this is from, from the end of the play where he has realized what he has done um, and he goes to find uh, uh, Jocasta. He howled a dreadful howl and then as though he had some guide, he hurled himself against the double doors and forced the panels from their frames and plunged into the room. Now, I have to apologize to your teachers here if they consider this to be inappropriate for school children. But I want to say that this is what the play itself chooses to dwell on. Uh, okay, this is, uh, I mean, this is very Sophoclean, in fact. And I'm here to help you appreciate the power of the play for what it is, symbolism and all. As Oliver Taplin says in a beautifully crafted note in his translation of the play that I showed you, it is hardly a heady excursion into Freudian symbolism to recognize in this narrative a reenactment of Oedipus's incestuous displacement of his father. He forcefully, as these words suggest, breaks the closed doors of his parents' marital bedroom and plunges in. The same image that was a little earlier used by the chorus about his entering his mother's harbor. And I will uh, expand a little bit more about this image of the harbor and, and general um, you know, uh, curvatures and cavities. And we will see this in a minute. Okay, another parenthesis also to lighten things up a bit because I think we all feel a bit awkward now. Uh, um, uh, if, you ever <laughs> if you ever thought that it was a bit unconvincing that Oedipus 
upon solving the riddle of the Sphinx and alongside becoming a king, um, also had to marry uh, his widow Jocasta. It's just actually, uh, this is what actually I thought when I was 16 and I was taught to play. Okay, I thought, yeah, fine, he beat the Sphinx, then he got the rulership. Did he also have to marry the widowed queen? It's, uh, it's a bit dodgy. Um, so I want to make you think of this and understand it um, in terms of imagery and symbolism as well. Okay, in Greek imagination, which is, of course, very male-centered, okay? um, getting the victory and getting the woman are often presented as two sides of the same coin. Okay? Um, of the whole concept of being successful, being victorious. Again, one reinforces the other. Okay? The, the successful man gets the woman as well. So I think this is probably how we need to understand this. Gets the rulership, gets the, the queen. Um, so... Um, um, so Oedipus, as we saw, went inside his new home with the utmost confidence and force. But it's a catastrophic entrance. We get a chilling feeling about this early on in the play when the prophet Tiresias is provoked by the angry Oedipus to reveal what he knows and says, there is no anchorage, there is no hollow in Kitharan's mountainside that shall not resonate in echo to your cry once you have learned about your marriage song and what a treacherous harbor home you entered in full sail, thinking your voyage fair. And there is a further crowd of horrors, which you will find enough to crush you and your children too. Now, despite the cryptic language of the prophet, the connotations of this entering movement do not, again, as Tapling would say, need Freudian expertise to understand them, especially since Tiresias' pronouncement ends with a reference to the children produced in that home. Oedipus himself makes one of the most hair-raising descriptions of the space that harbored this repugnant uh, mixing of generations because of this incest. He says, you first engendered me, and then, once born, emitted that same seed, and so you brought to light fathers who were brothers, children who had sibling blood, and brides who were both wives and mothers, along with the other acts which are most repugnant for humanity. This is how he perceives the house now, so he ends up begging to get out of that place. And he says, so now at once I beg you, throw me out somewhere or kill me off. The victorious, as it seemed at first, life journey of Oedipus in search of who he is has come to a tragic conclusion. He feels that he does not belong in the house anymore, and he needs to be sent away or killed off. This is a particularly poignant irony, if you think about it. Having found the true house and the true land that gave birth to him as a legitimate son and heir, he now knows that he doesn't belong here, far from it. It becomes um, even more heart-wrenching, uh, I think, and, and poignant when we consider that the last time Oedipus was sent away from the house that gave birth to him to be killed off was when he was sent to die on the mountain Kithiron as a newborn baby. Hence, the only place that he feels uh, he belongs to is the mountain, the wilderness that nearly killed him in his infancy. When Creon, at the end, uh, uh, worried about the pollution of Oedipus um, uh, is exposed to the sun, worried that the pollution of Oedipus is exposed to the sun, asks him to be accompanied inside uh, by saying this, accompany him inside the house, says Creon, immediately, for piety requires that only family should see and hear the troubles of their own. Then Mount Kithiron becomes the only desired destination at this point for Oedipus. No, let me go and live up in the mountains. There, this mountain, which is famed as mine, my own Kithiron, the place my mother and my father, when alive, had designated as my proper tomb, so then I will die as they had meant to do away with me. If you have read the play, you will have seen, also, that as it progresses and unfolds towards the end, mountain Kithiron acquires an increasingly central role in our consciousness and in the life journey of Oedipus um, that we have been tracking alongside him. 
we already saw the mountain being called upon in the earlier clash between Tiresias and Oedipus, when the prophet, with the prophet suggesting that the mountain will have a sinister role in the future life of the king. Now, it comes into our vision as the destination of the very first journey um, uh, that Oedipus had taken in the very first uh, days of his life. It was Mount Kithiron that preserved Oedipus and passed him on to his adopted house in Corinth, thus completing the first part of the journey, which we saw uh, later on, uh, from, starting from Corinth, um, uh, continuing from Corinth. But the Mount Kithiron has a wider significance in the play. In Greek mythic imagination, mountains were imagined as wild and uncultivated. They often embodied the polar opposite of the polis. Um, okay, Greeks really like to think in, in uh, polarities. Um, so uh, as we say, kind of uh, polis, the place of societal organization and culture. So um, mountains are the place of wilderness where societal organization doesn't apply. As they themselves, uh, the mountains engendered only wild elements and beasts, and sometimes gods, actually, and that's, but that's another story, sadly not true in Oedipus' case. Uh, but if you have read the play, you will remember now that at some point the chorus is entertaining the possibility that Oedipus might have, after all, been born as a god um, on the mountain. But anyway, now we, unfortunately, we are only entertaining the uh, wilderness side of the, of the mountains. Um, so as, as the mountains uh, engendered only wild elements and beasts, so they accepted the unwanted subjects of the police, including undesirable children. Oedipus' own name as the child of the swollen uncles, this is what his uh, 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 name means, is a constant reminder for us that he was one of these individuals, one of these children that had been thrown away from the civilized concept of, uh, context of a community, that cannot accept a destined murderer and an incestuous relationship in its space. <clears throat> now, in the certainty of his life story in the beginning of the play, Oedipus considered himself the son of a polis, Corinth. And you know, thanks to his intellect, he had also been made the king of another glorious polis, uh, Thebes, in which he actually had thrived until now as a ruler. His realization, expressed by his words, um, the mountain there, this mountain, which is famed as mine, my own Kithiron, could not be more diametrically different from this initial certainty. Later in the play, mountain Kithiron is personified and viewed as a woman who accepted the baby in her arms okay, and preserved its life. Um, again, this is part of the, his uh, realization. Oh, Mount Kithiron, why accept me in your arms? Why not kill me there and then so that I never could have shown the world where I was born from? The mountain is suggested, therefore, to be almost a nurse, um, a substitute for Oedipus' real mother, Jocasta, who only held the baby in her arms for three days. It is the mountain that took him and nurtured him, he suggests. This is even more so when you realize the place that the mountain has in the imagery uh, of the play. It is almost a surrogate of his mother, as we said, but unfortunately also imagined as a sexual partner in their marital bed. Let us revisit uh, Tiresias' word uh, here. There is no anchorage, there is no hollow in Kithiron's mountainside, okay, he's evoking the image of the cavity, uh, that um, shall not resonate in echo to your cry once you have learned about your marriage song and what a treacherous harbor home you entered in full sail, thinking your voyage fair. The feminine images of the curvatures, both mountain hollows and also natural recesses in the land that forms harbors, echoing the cry that Oedipus is said to give out, evoke the unfathomable unfathomable despair at the end of the play. Okay. Uh, when he's realized that he has had a sexual relationship with his mother and the land and, he, um, and the landscape has a central role in this. The connection between mountain and mother uh, is also made repeatedly through the image of the land plowed by the hero 
and also the agricultural imagery, the themes um, uh, uh, throughout the play. It climax, this imagery climaxes towards the end when the hero says, your father was the killer of his father. Uh, this is when he's talking to his children after he has gouged out his eyes. And then he plowed and sowed the mother from whom he himself had grown from seed. Earlier on, the children had also been referred to as misbegotten crops and double crops by their mother on her way to her suicide. The images of infected nature and flawed growth highlight how Oedipus's incestuous relationship had caused the earth to react violently. And now this is useful because it can take us back to understand the first um, um, uh, uh, scenes of the play a little bit in more depth because it can give us an explanation of, um, for another, a, another explanation for uh, what causes the disease and the plague and the sterility um, and this violent reaction of, of the earth uh, when the citizens of Thebes uh, re uh, report that they're suffering from disease and barrenness that is plaguing their land. They say, uh, the buds that should bear fruit become diseased. Okay? Our grazing cattle flocks become diseased. Our women's labor pains produce stillbirths. The onset of disease, barrenness, and sterility in the land are, we get to understand now, not only because of the killing of the king and the presence of the killer in the land. They are, as the connection that we have uncovered between landscape, womb, and motherhood, because of the unnatural relationship that Oedipus has with his own mother. So to conclude, we got to see then how important the places are in Oedipus' journey in search of some certainty for his own identity and life story, and also how indelibly this extraordinary story has marked the landscape. As my student uh, Amy um, writes in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in a piece in the program, uh, which I also am encouraging you to, to read, uh, the land the landscape does indeed remember. From the diseased land that mirrors the relationship of Oedipus with his mother, to the paternal house in Thebes that, like a double womb, gave birth to Oedipus and hosted his unnatural marriage, to the mountain that became his surrogate mother and by preserving him allowed these unnatural events to take place, to the three roads where Oedipus's first decisions about his life journey started, by killing his father unknowingly and heading to plunge into his paternal home. This is a landscape of key spaces full of symbolic significance. As the play draws to a close, Oedipus, as we saw, expresses his wish to retreat to Mount Kithairan, the only space that with its wilderness, but also as another mother and nurturer, with its role in determining the direction of his life, he feels is appropriate for his unspeakable deeds. The play, as it is preserved, uh, does not suggest that he's allowed to go back to his cruel nurse, the mountain, um, which had been destined to be his tomb so long ago. He is forced to go back into the house, back into the womb that bore him and his children, back to the place that will not allow him to forget. The final section of Oedipus Tyrannus is well known for its editorial problems okay? uh, uh, and probable interpolations by later hands at, as it was restaged and reperformed um, you know, by um, 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 other uh, um, uh, uh, dramatists and actors than, um, than uh, Sophocles. And this is not the place for me to discuss this, although I do want to make you aware of the fact that it is very probable that Sophocles' script was different itself and possibly already open-ended, like all the other Sophoclean plays are. Whatever the case, now that we saw the paradoxical link between the mountain and the house, it is up to us to make sense of the final preserved lines of the play and decide of the direction, on the direction of the hero's final exit. Because of that final exit, the horrific journey of Oedipus Tyrannus is over until the next play, Oedipus at Colonus which if you read, uh, has another life journey dramatized. Thank you very much. <laughs>